Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been a lot of people who expected an end of the world as we know it. Memories of the 2008 global financial crisis came to mind and a lot of market commentators compared the fallout from the pandemic to what happened when the American real estate bubble burst in 2008. I have no memories of any kind of pain or suffering that happened back in 2008. A few years later, however, with the magic of Netflix and an abundance of free time because my 12th standard board exams were right around the corner, I came across a movie called The Big Shot that did explain what the global financial crisis was all about. The Big Shot had everything a teenage boy could possibly like. Popular actors and actresses, lots of swearing and a manner of storytelling that made even the listener feel smart. However, back then, The only place where I'd seen an actual mortgage in action was on the Monopoly board. I did end the movie feeling a whole lot smarter, even though I didn't fully understand the whole picture. So, for today's cup of coffee, I'm going to try and break down what happened during the global financial crisis of 2008. What is your most valuable asset? If you were to go up to people all over the world and you ask them one single question, what is the most valuable thing that you own? From Bengaluru to Los Angeles, most people would give you the same one-word reply. They would say that their home has been their most expensive investment. The psychology behind the thinking is really simple. Home signifies security and prestige. And people who own a home are automatically regarded as more financially well-off in society than people who don't. Public perception is that real estate is an asset and everyone wants a piece of the pie. So the next question is, if the universal truth is that everyone wants to own a home, how do people pay for them? Unless you're exceptionally rich and can afford to make a lump sum payment to the developer, you'll go to a bank or a lender and take out a home loan. In the US, a more common term for a home loan is a mortgage. In a mortgage, the bank will lend you the money required to pay for your house, charging you interest in the process. But first, you will have to show the bank that you are credit worthy and make an advance payment of around 20% of your house's value. Once the contract is signed, you will have to make monthly payments to the bank. If you happen to default on your loan, the bank can seize your property as collateral. What is an MBS? The seeds of the financial crisis of 2008 were planted because of something known as a mortgage-backed security or MBS. Thousands of mortgage loans are packed together to make a single MBS. So you might wonder, why is something like this done? Every mortgage that is given out is actually just a contract between the homeowner and the bank. The bank agrees to give a certain sum of money and in exchange, the borrower is expected to make monthly payments. If the borrower fails to pay back the loan, the home is seized by the bank and sold to somebody else. The bank is thus able to recover its money, hence the term mortgage-backed security. We found out earlier that everyone wants to own a home, but do banks really have the ability to lend out so much money? If they only lent out their own money for mortgages, then there will come a point where even the banks will have to close its doors to new homeowners. Luckily, this does not need to happen. What the banks do at this point is that they take a bundle of these loans and package them into an MBS. Once a mortgage-backed security is made, the loans are sold to someone who has the funds to pay for them. These entities are generally pension funds and mutual funds. If you strip away all the complex financial terms, a mortgage-backed security is just a loan as well. This technically speaking is a win-win situation for everyone involved. The homeowner is happy because she has finally got her dream home. The banker is happy because he is able to make money on the fees he charges for the home loan. And the buyer of the mortgage-backed security will be able to get interest on the home loan. Big funds prefer these kind of investments because mortgage-backed securities give them a steady source of income at very low risks. So getting back to the movie, we have four main characters. The first is a man named Dr. Michael Burry, a doctor and a hedge fund manager who is running the firm Scion Capital. Burry is credited as being one of the first investors to foresee the 2008 mortgage crisis. Jared Bennett based on real-life Greg Lipman, worked for Deutsche Bank as the global head of their asset-backed securities trading department. Mark Baum, in real life named Steve Eisman, is the head of another firm known as Front Point Partners. And the fourth are Charlie Geller and Jamie Shipley, based on real-life Charlie Ledley and Jamie Mai from Brownfield Capital. So what caused the collapse of 2008? So now that we've reintroduced the main characters 
The question that arises is what went wrong with mortgage-backed securities in 2008. Before a lender gives you a loan, it is his responsibility to perform what is known as a credit check. During a credit check, all of your assets are inspected and the lender gets an idea of what your debts are. After running all your data through a computer model, the banker will decide if you deserve a loan or not. The seeds of the 2008 financial crisis were sown when banks offered just about anyone low interest loans and loosened their lending standards. Many new people were able to buy houses that they didn't have the money to pay for and a housing bubble was fueled. The credit check that the lender was supposed to perform was completely ignored. Lenders then sold these loans to Wall Street investment banks who packaged them into mortgage-backed securities. Michael Burry realized that the mortgage-backed securities that were being sold by the banks were very risky, mainly because the lending standards had become so poor. If interest rates had increased, and they did in 2007, then a lot of borrowers would default on their loan. And if too many people decided that they wanted to sell their homes, there would be a sudden drop in real estate prices. A crash in the real estate market would mean that customers would find themselves paying $500,000 in mortgage loans for a home that was now worth less than half. Dr. Buddy picked up on this in 2005 and he decided that he should take action before others also found out the truth. Hence, he decided that he would bet against the housing market through something known as a credit default swap. Now you might be wondering, what the hell is a credit default swap? Simple, it's just like insurance. When you buy a new car, the first thing that you also do is buy insurance. When something is insured, the owner has to pay a fixed sum every year known as the insurance premium. The entire idea sounds kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? Paying for insurance. So then why do people do it? We buy insurance because the future is unpredictable. Parts of the vehicle might fail, a tree might fall on your car if you park it on the street, or God forbid, you could meet with an accident while driving on the roads. All of these damages to your vehicle might cost a lot of money to get fixed. However, if you have insurance, then for a nominal sum known as the premium that you pay each year, you can rest assured that someone else will pay for any damages to your beloved gas guzzler. Much like how we protect ourselves from unpredictable events using insurance, Dr. Michael Burry bet against the housing market through the credit default swap. In total, he bought close to $1.3 billion worth of insurance. When it found out about Michael Burry's credit default swaps, and he then began to wonder why would someone do something like this. After running the numbers and doing his own study, when it comes out to a similar conclusion as Burry, he also felt that the housing market was overvalued and was going to crash. When it decides that he will begin selling insurance for a fee, and in the process, he comes across Mark Baum from Frontpoint Partners. When it introduces Mark Baum, to how the housing market works. He talks about how there are mortgage-backed securities of different risk profiles. AAA is considered the safest investment and it goes all the way down to B, which is considered the riskiest. When it says that the rating agencies in charge of scrutinizing these bonds have messed up and have failed to verify whether the AAA mortgage-backed securities are truly risky or not, bonds of thousands of borrowers with no jobs and rock-bottom credit scores were certified as AA and A. Investors were none the wiser because of the perverse incentives being given to the investment banks and lenders to sell these bonds. All in all, things are not okay. Once their meeting was done, Mark Baum and his team at Frontpoint Partners decide to do some of their own research. So they decide to go to Miami and see what the ground reality is for themselves. When they begin to investigate, they find an entire ghost town. The economy clearly had an oversupply of houses that no one was using. Even the few houses that did have a tenant, the owner was over 90 days delinquent, which is the same as defaulting on your mortgage loan. On hearing all of this gibberish, Mark and his teams would be convinced that there is a terrible bubble just waiting to explode. They get in touch with Jared Bennett and decide to buy $50 million through credit default swaps. Brownfield Capital Remember how we spoke about the various types of risk in a bond? So while everyone else was buying insurance on mortgage-backed securities, rated below A, Charlie Geller and Jamie Shipley shorted the most secure AA bonds. Because these tranches were perceived to be safe, the insurance on such a bond was far cheaper, which meant that if the mortgage-backed security was worthless, they would see a payoff of 200 times to 1. The safer the investment, the lesser the chance of default. And hence, even the insurance that needs to be paid is cheaper. 
none of the other big shots even thought of doing something so crazy. What Geller and Shipley had realized was that the tranches could be miscategorized by the credit rating agencies. Such mislabeling played a part in the mortgage meltdown of 2007 and the financial crisis that followed. What actually happened was that the tranches containing junk bonds or subprime mortgages were labeled as AAA or equivalent. This was done either because of incompetence, carelessness, or as some people like to say, even outright corruption on the agency's part. An example of how bad the situation really is, is revealed when Mark Baum meets a CDO manager, someone who is in charge of selecting CDOs for his customers. These managers are supposed to look after their clients' interests and make investments that are safe. However, Mark soon realizes that the CDO manager has been taking kickbacks in the form of commissions from the big banks. The CDO manager now has perverse incentives to make bad investment decisions for his clients. Mark gets furious because the CDO manager is actually outright lying to his clients by selling them subprime bonds, even though he knows that these bonds are going to be worthless soon. The financial meltdown of 2008 was not limited to just a single country. Even though it did start in the United States, the risks taken were distributed all over the world because of the globalized operation of financial institutions. So to summarize, the sparks for the real estate bubble began because of the sudden rush for people in the US to own a home. Because of the initial increase in demand, prices of real estate began to rise after years of being dormant. Lenders began to relax their standards of lending because they only wanted to make commissions on the houses that they sold. Since all the mortgages were being packed into mortgage-backed securities and being sold to big investors, these lenders did not need to monitor the credit worthiness of the people that they were giving money to. Predatory lending standards meant that in the second quarter of 2007, a lot of the mortgage rates would spike and a large percentage of homeowners would not be able to repay their loans. Finally, the bubble began to burst in 2007 when people began to default on their home loan payments in large numbers. At the end of it all, billions of people lost their homes worldwide and governments had to pump in trillions of dollars through quantitative easing programs to ensure that the financial markets did not fail. The global financial crisis of 2008 was something that affected every single person living on the planet. Whether we knew about it or not, the fallout from 2008 has greatly influenced our current lifestyles. Being able to share such a big event with so many of you is truly an incredible experience. I hope that you enjoyed this month's video. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And if you like the content that you found here, check out my other videos on investing as well. If there is any specific topic out there that you would like to see in the future, please do let me know in the comments below. As always, we are open to any tips and suggestions that you might have in mind. Keep smiling and until we meet again, this is Filter Coffee Finance signing off.